Do you know it was in December 7th, 1941? A great event happened at the time. A Japanese fleet started streaming south, led by an admiral called Ishura, Ishu, Ishuroku Yamamoto. This general had a, uh, this admiral had one objective, and that objective was to be able to destroy the whole U.S. Pacific fleet. And not just the fleet alone, not just the battleships alone. In his vision was a plan to destroy the aircraft carriers. Because in those days, the aircraft carriers extended <clears throat> the ability of aircraft to operate beyond just land bases. And he had his aircraft carrier. And that morning, some of you might have seen the show of Torah, Torah, Torah or Pearl Harbor. And that morning, as he was launched, that was a code name. If you're able to achieve full surprise, Torah, Torah, Torah. And when he heard the cry, he was excited. And we understand the story of how the Pacific fleet of the US was caught in Pearl Harbor. And they were destroyed. But later he was to realize that none of the aircraft carriers were there because the aircraft carriers had left the harbor. And he was reputed to have said, said these words, I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. I fear, he says, we have awakened a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. History was to prove him right. Why was he able to say that statement? Well, the reality was he's been to America and he began to realize something about America. And that America was a nation with tremendous resources, not only industrial might, but also human resources. And in fact, when they had the battle plan, the battle plan of Japan was that yes, they wanted to invade right down even to Australia. They wanted to get to the places where the raw materials were because that was the only way they could maintain the war effort they've started years fighting in China. They have already occupied Korea, they have already occupied Taiwan, but they needed to re get those resources. But you know something? Even in the battle plan, there was one hope that Yamamoto had. He had to destroy the fleet. Not so that they could conquer America, he said, so that we can neutralize America, that we can bring them to the point that they would negotiate. Well, by that time, the global war had extended. Hitler was already occupied most of Europe. Japan wanted to get back in on the act, but he realized something. Up to that time, America was not in the war. Why? Because America was caught up with their own distractions. America was caught up with their own pleasures and everything else. And no American president wanted to get into another world war. Because the First World War had been costly. And I tell you this. If the Japanese had succeeded, you and I would not be talking in English. You and I will probably be speaking in Japanese today. <laughs> but you must understand something. He had this fear because he understood not only how strong the enemy can be, but the fullness of the potential of an enemy that was sleeping, that was not concerned with world affairs at that time, was more concerned with their own things. And as I was preparing for the prophetic word to give for this year, as God began to remind me of so many things, including what God was doing, and you've heard this, I've spoke about it the two weeks ago, about a new generation that God is raising. A new generation to enter the land. A new generation to be able to possess the very promises 
that God has laid up for humanity. I want you to hear this. The very 7,487 promises that God has laid up for humanity right down from the foundations of the earth when He created. Yes, God had a plan. God did not create haphazardly. God did not create as an afterthought. God did not create just because He felt like creating. He had a plan. And unfortunately, God's plan from the beginning was thwarted. By one word, because of one man's disobedience, sin came into the world. Was God surprised? I'll tell you, no. God had a plan B. God had a plan B, that's what the Bible says. That He had prepared a lamb. He had prepared a sacrifice. From the foundations of the earth, He had prepared it. He had even showed through Scripture His intent that there's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. And he began to teach the people of old what it was to mean to perform animal sacrifices. But God was preparing for the ultimate, the ultimate where his plan B would come into mutation. And I want you to hear this. God has no plan C. I want you to repeat this again. God has no plan C. One amen. You see, the church was in that very plan of God. In Genesis 1.26, when God created man, He said, let us make man. I want you to hear this again. Let us make man. He's talking singular, M-A-N. And in this, I need you to hear, I need you to understand, God cares for each and every one of you individually. That's what the Bible says. Jeremiah 29, 11 reminds us. He says, for I know the plans I have for you. Yes, he was referring to Israel. But there is a rhema in that, that he's speaking to future generations too. That God knows the plan he has individually for each and every one of you. And those plans are of good and not evil plans to give hope and a future. Hope and a future, I want to hear this. Because even today, in that plan was the church. He said, let us make man individual. And then he said, let them. The word them is plural. The word them is not just Eve alone. Sometimes we limit the verse down to God creating Adam and then he was, had his mind Eve and he had a family. But I want you to hear this. God's plan was not just for individual, not just for individual family. God's plan is for establishing of a kingdom here on earth. A kingdom where he could truly be the king of kings and the lord of lords. A kingdom that he was raising. A people of power, a people of praise, a people that would have dominion. <clears throat> you see, in creation, you must understand, the key word was he didn't create you and I just without an intent. There is an objective in all this. That you and I would be able to have dominion. But you see, the word dominion often is misunderstood. The word dominion today, because in our fallen nature, when we think of dominion, we think of a person who rules and a person who use and abuse people, the one who can just be like a king, a king can do whatever he wants and get away with it. I want you to hear this. That's not God, what God intended. As God created, I want you to hear this word of God reminds us that each and every one of us and all of humanity is awesomely and fearfully created. I couldn't understand it. I was born. I didn't realize that I was born a sinner. When I was born, I was born in a Christian family. So I always tell people, I'm a Christian. But I didn't understand God's plan and purpose. And I want you to hear this. There is also an enemy 
that was there right from the beginning. That was there that came to kill, to steal, destroy. And it's even today, the Bible says, even after Jesus has come to pay the price. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, there is a thief that still cometh to kill and to steal and to destroy. And he's still working. And he's still using the same plans. Have we learned the lesson? Have we understood who we are? America, in the early days before they entered the war, never understood their potential. But when they did, when the whole country galvanized, yes, they galvanized the whole country to production. They were able to supply ships, planes, weapons to, Amer to England, to England to hold out. They were able to supply men. And they did the same thing also in this part of the world. The church, we need to understand, was in God's plan. And I need you to understand this. For a long time I struggled, God, I'm in the flesh. How can I understand what your plan is? And so if we don't, we get caught with our own diversions. We get caught with our own ambitions. We get caught by our own visions. And I tell you this, although I was born a Christian, by the time I'm 40 years old, there's nothing Christian about my life. By that time, money had become my God. By that time also, I was a man of the world. I was smoking, I was drinking, I was gambling, and believing, yeah, the good things in life is what we are meant to have. My wife will only be interested in driving a BMW. I'll be interested in only driving a Mercedes. And it was about staying in landed properties, about this and that. I want to tell you this. When I look back and think of those days, I'm embarrassed. I'm serious. One day I was in, in Gardner Hotel and still around, and all of a sudden one of my old cronies walked in. And he was like, ah, and I was like, mm, because I have some Christian friends with me. And there he was, like what I used to be, with gold Rolex watch, gold bangle, and all these diamond studded glasses and everything. <laughs> and I almost cringed, even I used to be like that. <laughs> but in those days, we thought that those were the things of success. How foolish that we often deceive ourselves. It were the things that are insignificant. I want you to hear this. How many know that God wants you to possess possessions too. But the problem is the devil is so shrewd that in the cause of it, the possession possess you. Let me repeat it if you didn't get it. How many know God knows? Uh, let me quote from Scripture. Matthew chapter 6. Jesus said this. What? Life is not about, the kingdom is not about what you eat, what you drink, what you wear. For these are the things the Gentiles seek, right? And yet in the very next expression he said, But the Father in heaven knows that of these things you have need. He didn't say, don't get rich. I want to tell you this. God created men for the purpose of dominion. But the problem is instead of being able to take dominion, the end result often is we get dominated. Somebody say amen to that. I know you all are not like that. But let's look at scripture for a minute. And I want to turn here because I want to set something before I want to get into some foundations to be understand who God created us to be. Now, <clears throat> let's look at this. I'll look at Ah, Second Timothy. First Timothy, okay. First Timothy, are you all there? Chapter 6. Verse 6, let's start from there. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Only hear this word. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I thought possession was a great gain. But God says, godliness and contempt is a great gain. And here comes the key word, the next verse. 
For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And how true it is. Actually, when you, bo- you get born, here's an interesting observation. We get born in a fallen world. And the Bible says, since the days of G- Adam, man is now reproducing them- themselves in sin. And if you look at how a baby comes, I've looked at babies. I've got children myself. And one interesting thing when the baby is born, do you know the baby comes with a fist clenched at this? As if the baby knows, I'm coming in this world. Chinese say, like pia, like po liao. I'm coming here to struggle. I'm coming here to, you know, fight. And, and look what happens when a man dies. Have you seen a man die? A man doesn't die with clenched fist. I've never seen a man, dead man with clenched fist. He's always got, it is finished. Everything is gone. <laughs> One generation can make the money, the Bible says, right? Chinese say, second generation spend the money. And what happened? Third generation, no money. And this is true. That's the deceitfulness of wealth. It's not something that you can take with you. So the Bible says something here. Verse 8, And having food and raiment, let us dare with content. And having food and clothing, let us therefore there be content. But they that will be rich, now he didn't say you cannot be rich, but they that will be rich can fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drowns men in destruction and perdition. Now, this is important, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, I want you to get this straight. The Bible never said that money is evil, right? It says the love of money. And this is important. Which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see, sometimes we don't understand. We think that just because a person is rich, therefore he must be right with God. You know what the psalmist said? When I saw how the wicked prosper, he said, my heart was troubled. That's what the psalmist said. But when I finally entered the presence of God, when I saw what is the outcome, he said, I could only praise God and say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. You see, in life, who holds the final outcome? God. We don't. We can't control things. We can't even control the time we are born. We can't control the family we are born in. We can't even control the day we die. That's reality. Because it's God who is the Alpha in the beginning and it's God, Omega, at the end. But we need to understand something. Sometimes we think between the Alpha and Omega, it is life that we can lead on our own. But I want to tell you something. I've learned this. How you lead your life today will truly determine where you go in the final day. And this is important. If you lay up treasures here on earth, when you go to eternity, you'll be a poor man. (laughs) The Bible says, lay up the right treasures. And money is nothing wrong, but money has a purpose. And the Bible says, love for money is a road evil, which was some covered after. The key is he didn't say, you can't have money. Do you covet after money? Covetousness. Next verse. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. And verse 12, I love this. Often we quote this out of context. Fight the good fight of faith. Do you know the fight the good fight of faith? It's not just about the other things of life. One of the most important fight of faith you have is about who is the source of your provision. Is it God? Is it your own effort? Do you know the devil can also supply? Amen. People make covenants with the devil as well. 
Pastor Jimmy, in Pat Pat Tesley, he made covenant. And do you know that he had spirits around him? When he gambled, he can look at a card and he can even pray and the card can change. And that's how he became a rich man. And the day when the Spirit told him, you're finished. You're something he did, but I won't tell you the whole story. That day was a day he started losing all the way down. I want to tell you this. Intervention of God came in. Spiritual occult went out. This is so important. Fight the good fight of faith. What are you called to do? Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. When you, the day you declare that you believe in Jesus, you have made a good profession of faith. The day when you did that, I want to tell you this, you crossed over from darkness into His marvelous light. But I want you to hear this. God did not make you to be in darkness. God did not create man to be in darkness. God created man specially. In creation, we need to understand something. What did God do? In the rest of creation, read the Bible, God just called the things out. God called the things, Romans 4, 17 says, the things which be not as though they were. Let that be, and there was. Let that be, and there was. Let that be, and there was. But yet it came to man. The Bible, he didn't say, let man come out. The Bible says, he lovingly fashioned man. With like his hands, he fashioned man. With great attention, intent, and purpose. I want you to hear this. I didn't understand this. When I got saved again, I said, God, I need to get my handles on this. And God told me, listen, there's 66 books here. There's 7,487 promises for you here. 66 books. And you need these 64 books to be upright in your shelf. I said, God, upright, but books topple, right? He said, that's right. There are two books, Genesis and Revelation. Let these two books be your book stands. When you have these two books, their book stands, the rest of the books will stand up and mean a difference in your life. So I went and studied Genesis. And boy, did I study Genesis. I tell you, I prayed, I bought every book, and then I prayed and I prayed and God began to reveal something. The word, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The first thing I want you to hear is, give me the chart, the nature of men. Just now you showed earlier. <laughs> okay, those who are in our club, my class, you have heard so much of this. And I want you to understand this. Why are you awesomely, fearfully, wonderfully made? You see, when God took earth, He not only fashioned a body, there was a physical body, and God intended the physical body to be able to live in a physical realm. You see, God created not a spiritual realm, He created an actual garden. He created a physical realm. His intention for men to have dominion is not up there in the highest heaven where He is. It is right here that He's created the first and the second heaven. Okay, I don't want to go into teaching on the first, second heaven, but enough to understand. In that body, he gave man five senses. Sight, touch. We are able to hear, we are able to test, taste, we are able to smell. And with these five senses, we are affecting the world and being affected by the world. How many realize that? When you lose one of your senses, when you go blind, for example, you lose part of the ability of what God intended for you to have dominion. If you lose hearing, for example, it affects again. When you lose the ability to touch, it affects again. I want to tell you, God made man perfect with all five senses alive. And then the Bible teaches us too that you and I were not just made a physical body, you are made with a spirit. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit, I'm talking about human spirit. Okay, I can go to different verses, but I shall not because I don't want to do this whole teaching. If you want to get the whole teaching, join CVSOM. 
But in this, we need to understand that God gave man a spirit. In that spirit, you and I are able to operate in the spiritual realm. Yes, there is a spiritual realm. And we must understand the relativity of the two. In the spiritual realm, you must understand, it has power. It has dominion over the natural. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 2 tells us, by faith we know. The worlds were created or framed. I like the word frame. It's as if God created the world like a picture frame. Were framed by the word of God. And that which was unseen, the spiritual, birthed out that which is seen, the natural. And we are to live both in that body, physical realm, in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, just quickly, I'll say, we have an intuition. Sometimes people don't understand intuition. They get mixed up. They call it a sixth sense. But intuition, I want you to hear, is not a physical sense. It is a spiritual. In intuition, you can move in the things of the Spirit. And in the things of the Spirit, I want you to hear this. God is a Spirit, and He's not limited by time. He's not limited by space. He's not limited by matter. To us, time, we can think of past, present, future. God sees time for eternity. To Him, one day is a thousand years. thousand years, one day. That's how God sees it. For us, we only see three-dimensional time. That's because we are not operating fully in a way God wants us to be. Einstein is a genius. And he was also not operating fully. They say he's only using only 18 to 20% of his brain capacity. You know, in his theory of relativity, he saw 11 dimensions of time. Wow! But you and I were created in the very image and likeness of God. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, so in that, God then gave man a soul. Now, I, I, we break this up for teaching. But understand, you can't separate spirit, soul, and body. As the Trinity of God is one, man, tripartite, is also one. You are one, but you cannot separate. Yet, there is, for teaching purposes, I show you, they operate different functions. And in that soul, God gives man emotions. Often referred to the Bible as a heart, and that's not the physical organ. A heart is about the emotions. And you must understand that God create, gave man an intellect, a mind. In that mind was the ability to think, to evaluate. That mind is not the brain. The brain is a physical organ full of neurons, nerves connected. Any doctors here? And with that, you can do a lot of function and everything else. But the mind is a metaphysical. You see, this soul is really something that bridges spiritual and physical. And in this soul then, as it bridges, understand, the brain is physical organ, the mind is a metaphysical organ. If I to describe in computer terms today, is that the brain is the hardware, brain, hardware. Yeah, computer hardware. In the brain, got a lot of gigabytes and what have you not. But your mind is a software. And actually, the mind in creation was created to be able to run the whole capacity of that hardware. But because of the fall, the mind became impaired. I'll talk about that in a bit. And this is important. So when God created man, He gave man also free will. Volition, the Bible talks about. Will. Will in that, in the ability to make choices. I want you to tell you, God understands He can't put you in dominion if you can't make right choices. Somebody say amen. And you must understand this. So we are created a total man, spirit, soul, and body, one. Now, very quickly, jump to the next one for me. In the nature of man, what's the next one you have there? Ah. So, Okay, before we go there, let me ask a question. You see, when God created man, He created us wonderful. What is the very purpose? Let's go back to Genesis 1.26. What did He say? Let us make man in our image and after likeness. 
Now, why I want you to understand, if you hear this, the trouble is too many get, people get information, they have no revelation in that information. And they don't see it relevant. I get so frustrated when I explain this to people, and they say, yeah, 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 okay, okay. So what? I'm not calling my friend, so what? But you say, so what? You know? I want to tell you, if you don't understand this, you'll never be the person of significance, that person of influence that God wants you to be right from foundations of the earth. Forget about the fall for a minute. I'll just talk about this. He said, image and likeness. You know, here comes a hint. How does God want men, men take oh, dominion? The word image. Now, when you think of image, what do you think of? You go look in the mirror, that's an image, right? But the word very interesting in Hebrew is the word bet zalem B T Z E L E M. CBSOM students should know it by now. And Beth Salem is a very interesting Hebrew word. <clears throat> it carries the, the meaning of a replica. That's why they couldn't find a word, they put an image, like a replica. But in the word Beth Salem <clears throat> is an active nuance. It's not just a dead replica. It is a replica to replicate, to do as God does. So God makes you to be a replica, to replicate what he does. You cannot do anything on your own apart from God. This is important to understand. When Jesus came, what was the thing he said? I can do nothing except what I see the Father do. Now this is important. Because we are in a generation right now, God is restoring us to be the people of power and the people of praise. The people that can take dominion again. And you cannot do anything apart from God. That's why Jesus said again, I can do nothing except what I see the Father do. You and I, we can do nothing except what we see Jesus do. Somebody shout amen. amen. And this is to understand the other word is likeness. Do we look like God? God is not a man. He's got no eyes, no nose. I know the Bible talks in terms of as if he has, but he's a spirit. Okay, and this is important. Here comes the first key. What is the word demuth, likeness? D-E-M-U-T-H in Hebrew. Demuth really means you resemble God. But how do you resemble God? I want you to hear this. The word demuth has a nuance of being a root word, a prime word that actually you resemble in the inner qualities. And really, I want you to hear this very quickly. I don't want to go into the whole Greek uh, Hebrew study, but enough to know this. God created man to resemble him in his nature, in his character, in his abilities, and in his capabilities. Now, if you can understand this in creation, when Adam was created, do you know God created Adam and called him Adam, why? Adam in Hebrew means man. Because Adam must have all the attributes like God. Then even the animals could say, oh, I thought it was God, but only Adam. <laughs> only man. But we're not God. Please understand. He neither slumbers nor sleep. But God created us in His image to replicate Him in doing as He would do. And very important, as what? In the resemblance, we have the nature and character of God. God is love. Now, <clears throat> it took me a long time to work this out because I thought unconditional love was a choice. We make a choice to love unconditionally. You can't. God did not make a choice to love unconditionally because love, unconditional love, so to speak, agape, is His nature and character. Because of that, God cannot not love you. No matter how bad you are, whatever you've done wrong, He cannot not love you because that's His nature and that's character. Amen. Okay, but don't get carried away, huh? Because God is also righteousness. He cannot not judge you. Okay, I won't go that way, but enough to understand. We actually was created exactly in the image and after likeness of God. For dominion. And dominion cannot be taken unless done God's way. Please internalize that. Dominion cannot be taken unless done God's way. 
Somebody shout amen. amen. And I need you to hear this. Was man perfect at creation? Yes. Was man ready for dominion in creation? I believe so. Let me ask a question then. Why did God create man for dominion in the world and then put him in a garden? Okay, I'll unpack this very quickly because time is running out. You see, a lot of times I don't understand the garden experience. It took me a long time. It didn't make sense why God created Adam for dominion in the world and then put him in the garden. Is it because he was not perfect? Then I begin to realize God was trying to show Adam, you have ability in everything, every way. But you cannot operate without and apart from God. What God was trying to show Adam is something so fundamentally important. You see, you can own a Ferrari, but if you don't know the boundaries of how to operate a Ferrari, you're going to be like the Boogie Street accident. You're going to crash it. Just because you have power doesn't mean you can do anything you want. So what's the garden about? It took me a long time to work it out until God put these words. You see, I created man with a purpose. Dominion is a purpose. In dominion, there's work. And God was trying to show in the garden, man, I want you to understand, in this dominion, there's gainful and purposeful work. I want to hear this. God has gainful and purposeful work. Not just work. Many of us are just working and we may be under a curse. We are not being gainfully and purposefully employed as God wants us to be. Now, God is unique. Seven billion people in the world, God got seven gainful and purposeful plans for each and every one. God says, I know the plans for everyone. He's God, that's why. And here he begins to teach us what is gainful and purposeful work for God. Let's look at Genesis chapter 8, uh, chapter 2, verse 8 now. Bit of Bible study because I want you, now this is it. Because we are in an era right now about that new generation, we're going to move in. But if we don't understand who we are, how we are to function, you will still be at the devil's whim and fancy. You'll be caught up with the wrong priority. And I need you to understand this. And here, Genesis 2, 8. Now, I want you to turn there very quickly. Genesis 2, 8. And I'm going to read here. After forming men, verse 8 says, And God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Two key words I want you to use here. God planted. And the word planted in Hebrew is nota. And nota is very interesting. Nota is not just about God just planting. It's about the word carries an action. It carries something else, intentionally doing it. And I want you to hear this. When you intentionally do something, you initiate. You see, God was trying to teach men that apart from me, you can do nothing. Everything, God says, I must be the one who initiate. Now, what happens to the fall today? We have our own plans. We have our own strategy. We plan and scheme. And then we do. And then God, please bless. Hello. God must be the one to initiate the plan for us. And what is God looking as he initiates? The word put. He put man. It's a very interesting Hebrew word, sum. And sum is not just about like that. It's about positioning. It's God has a plan where his whole plan is like this. And yet he wants and position each and every one into that part he wants you to play in that plan. He initiates and then he positions. And poor Adam, he thought dominion, I'm going to be king. What do you do? Be a gardener. You see, it's not about how big a calling God has in your life. God starts you on a small thing. And what is God looking for? There's a word in the Old Testament. You don't find the word faith as we know it in the New Testament, in the Old Testament. It's faithfulness. And there's something 
I want you to get in. Because if you can't understand this, you have your own plans, you have your own thing, and you're trying to do your own thing, and you keep wondering, why am I getting nowhere? God initiates, and God will position you. And God is looking for what? Faithfulness to do whatever He calls you to do. At whatever point of time, wherever you're positioned, be faithful. That's what God is trying to say. Don't have to do too much. God says, no, be faithful. If you are in faithful, the small things God taught me, He said, I will be more than faithful to you in the big things. Amen. Lord asks, do you want to do big things for God? God says, no, just be faithful. And as you are faithful, I will promote you. Amen. Next thing very important. Then God showed something else. I want to jump very quickly. This, I want you to understand why it's so important about the garden. If you don't grasp this foundation, we have a problem in the New Testament. Okay, in this foundation then, in Genesis chapter 2 again, verse 15, the Bible says, and here, I want you, verse 15, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Very interesting. The word put down there, same word as just now you saw in verse 8, put. But here is a different Hebrew word. The word put here is the word your nach. Your nach. And the word nach is an active word. Is for example, the word wait, those that wait upon the Lord, is ok nach. Ok nach, the active word again. Ok nach is not just passively waiting. It's not sitting down there waiting. It's about actively seeking God as you wait. So here, this word here, when God put there, better translated is God made man to rest. Very, very funny, right? God made man to rest. That's the better translation. And then told man, you've got a job to dress and to keep. Now, I want you to hear this. Rest. The Old Testament people could understand it. But the author of Hebrews, the New Testament, begin to show it in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. And the Word of God says, there therefore remains a rest for the people of God. And we are called to labour to enter the rest. Not to labour to work for God, but to enter the rest. And what does the word rest mean? And God explains it then. And when you enter the rest, you will cease from your own works. You will cease from trying to do things your own way. I want to tell you this. We had discussions. Some people came to me and said, Pastor, do you own this place? I said, no. He said, why do you own this place? I said, God never told me. But you must raise money. Money is out there for you to take. Treasures of darkness. Teach on tithe. Make your people tithe. Make them make offerings. They will give. You know what the Lord spoke to me? When He told Moses, Moses build the tabernacle, what did He say? The tabernacle must be built on free will offerings. Not hearts made willing by your own methods, but heart made willing by the Holy Spirit. Okay? There's a reason why God put giving. I'm not teaching about giving right now. But giving is a powerful weapon that God has put in our hands today as a New Testament saints. If we don't understand the dimension of sowing and reaping and giving, I want to tell you, let's look at this word now. So God positioned men to rest. And then the word to dress. The word dress is the Hebrew word, obat. And obat is a very, very thing. English, they couldn't find the word. They put dress, dressing. We think of dressing, what happened? Your salad dressing, make it look nice, right? <laughs> you think maybe dressing in the garden means I've got to prune it and make it nice. But no, the word here, abad, really talks about sowing and multiplying. You see, God is saying, I want you to understand whatever I put in your hands, I want you to be fruitful. Somebody shout amen. amen. God expects you to be fruitful, not just to take it, to enjoy it. God wants you to multiply because He has a purpose in multiplication. And that's where the rest comes from. You know, the rest is about faith. I couldn't understand. I said, God, what has rest got to do with faith? God says, if you don't hear from me, how do you know what to do? And you know that Actually, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, 9, and 10. This is very, very word that God led me to, and I couldn't believe it. That word is translated. Sometimes you hear, 
God's presence came and walked with Adam in the cool of day. I want to tell you, that's not what he says. The King James Version got it closer. The voice of God walked with Adam. It was not the presence of God. It was about the voice of God because you have the abilities, you have the capabilities, but until the residence of the Word of God comes, until faith begins, you can do nothing apart from Him. Amen. When the prayer was of Shandy, I think it's learning what? To exercise faith. To speak the thing into being. That was what the prayer was about. Because there are different dimensions of prayer. I'm not going to teach of prayer. CBSOM, Reverend Wilfred teaches on prayer. And we know there are different dimensions of prayer. The trouble is, we have not understood. We only go one prayer. Petition, help me God. I won't tell you this prayer of power. There's a prayer of faith. There's a prayer that brings God's power into every situation. There's power, I want you to hear this, to establish God's presence in your proclamation, in your declaration, as you hear from God, as you take authority. I want to tell you this. you got problem with finances. I had to learn in 1998 to learn to call the things which be not as they were. God said to me, no more, no more boring, no more nothing, but you learn to be able to walk in what I tell you to do. And I tell you this, I'm a testimony. You know why God made me do that? Because He told me, you can't preach faith without living faith. We have living faith, 18 years now, full time, trusting God. Have any of you heard me come and ask you, put guilt on you to give? No. Because God is my provider. If God says do it, do it. Don't do, don't do. But the market looks good. Let me tell you this. The Reverend Wilfred myself discussed it. In my old days, our old days is this. When you see a bear market, what do you do? Hey, good, short the market. <laughs> you say, me, Singapore market cannot short. Oh, America market, now global, anywhere you can go and short. And I tell you, when the market goes like this, you know when you short the market. But the trouble is this. If God never asks you to shot, you can shot until you get shot. <laughs> you don't know when to get out because greed comes in. If God didn't ask you to, don't do it. And this is important. Don't let your human wisdom, don't let strategy. I won't tell you, God can provide. I've seen God provide in all these 18 years without my own methods, without my own strategy. And this is something that God wants you to understand. Adam could not understand. He heard. But you see, let me show you something. The other word here, keep, is the Hebrew word, shoma. Shoma, shoma, okay. And shoma is not just about show your ma. <laughs> it actually talks about what? To learn to take ownership. To learn to do it. Owning it. Do you know man has not learned to take ownership over things God has given to him? We think we've got proprietary ownership. Sorry. You know it's proprietary ownership? Who owns the world today? God still owns the world. After the fall, he still says, the world in fullness thereof still belongs to me. What God has given to man is stewardship. What the devil stole is stewardship. And the devil is taking the treasures of God and putting it into treasures of darkness. Why didn't God stop him? Because God is raising up a people in the generation right now. If you understand God's way and what God wants, you will learn to take the treasures of darkness. Amen? But you see, before you do that, there are certain prerequisites. One is a condition of heart. That's why as we move in into the Joshua generation, what's the first thing God asked me to tell you all? You need the attitude of Caleb. You need to be moving in the anointing of Elijah, miracles, signs, and wonders. You need to be moving in the increase of Elijah. There is no limit, not just double. Elijah asked for double, but Jesus said, the works I do, you will do, and greater works. I tell you this, if you understand and you align and you begin to do, I want to tell you this. I tell you, I got many pastors coming to talk to me because they're struggling, they're struggling. And they're asking me, Hey, what's your secret? Huh? How do you raise money? You don't have a big church. I want to tell you, I don't raise money. And there's a key. 
some people find hard to work with me. I tell you honestly, why? What's your budget? No budget. Wow, so good. Ah. <laughs> what sort of strategy plan? No strategy, no plan. Huh? No, no, don't get me wrong. I don't say we do nothing. But I say I learn to hear. And then we do as God will tell us to do. Amen? Now, very important in this. What has happened in the fall? Very quickly. I want to show you the fall of men. The Bible says death reigns. Because of death, the spirit man is no more alive. What happened? Your body becomes very alive. Because the spirit man is no more alive. Why did the body become alive? I want to show you in a minute. And the body is now dying. Because there is something God gave. Two trees. And something we need to understand about the two trees. Let me give you that one about the nature of choice. You see, God's plan, we all know, is of good and not evil to give hope in the future, for you to have dominion, for you to be above and not beneath, right? Now, key, he put two trees. What did he tell Adam? Of every tree in the garden, you can eat except the tree of knowledge. Why? Did he tell Adam, tree of life? Nothing said. But only after the fall, they say, no, man cannot eat of tree of life anymore. Garden is now closed. But I want you to hear this. Turn with me very quickly to Revelation chapter 2. You know, it took me a long time. So I thought, okay, tree of life is not now applicable to us. But you know, Revelation chapter 2, the church in Ephesus, I want you to hear this word in Revelation chapter 2 about something. After talking to church at Ephesus, what did he say there? Uh, ah, verse 7. Okay. He that had here, here, let him hear where you're hearing from, what the Spirit says to the church. Correct? And what is that? To him that overcometh. I want to tell you this. Jesus said, in this world you have tribulation. What did he say? In me, he didn't say you've got no problem. You have peace. Why you have peace? Because Jesus said, I have overcome the world. What he's trying to say to us? You have been given a spirit overcomer. You hear, you can overcome. And to him that overcome will I give to eat of the tree of life. Wow. I want you to hear this. Today, the tree of life was barred from fallen men. But in the New Testament believer today, the tree of life is yours again. Amen. Amen. Conditions though. Hearing, overcoming. Now, why do we need the tree of life? Because it's a tree of life that enables us to move in the dimensions of the Spirit. And God always intended for the Spirit to take control of the soul and the soul then to control the body. But after the fall, what happened? What did knowledge do? Remember the soul one part is your brain. Knowledge in the fall. Let me, let me look at the, the chart I have on fall. I want you to see this on the fall. Yeah, result or wrong choice. The fall, okay? In the fall, one thing. He became God of the world. He brought death and sickness. But I want to tell you this. He thinks he's trying to balance you. No. Actually, you lost the ability to operate in the spirit. But now in the soul, you become very soulish because you now have soulish knowledge. The mind now becomes very strong. And that's why God says, no, 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 like that. Until I redeem, I cannot loudly eat a tree of life. Otherwise, they'll be like God, but in the wrong things. Because now, with knowledge, what happened? Your soulish things become. Your emotions become selfish, soulish. Your mind becomes soulish, selfish, evil. You can't make the right choice that God wants you anymore. And the devil now possesses you and will bring you into... I, I use a yin and a yang sign because... It's about balancing positive, negative, good, and evil. And that's what the devil is trying to do. People understand to balance your life. You are in the world, so make sure you've got to be in the world to live in the world. 
God said, no, you're in the world, but not of the world. Amen. Okay, so I will expand more on this next Sunday onward. <laughs> but this is important. If you don't understand what God has done, why? I want you to hear this. That's why the church is a sleeping giant today. I want you to hear this. We are a sleeping giant because we are caught up with all the wrong things. We are caught up with the wrong focus. We are caught up with trying to pursue after ambitions, money, and everything else. I tell you this, the sleeping giant needs to be awakened. You know why God said to me, why do you think I'm allowing all these things to happen? I won't tell you, it's not the devil. God permits the evil that's happening in the world today because He's trying to awaken the church. As the war allowed Japan to attend, attack Pearl Harbor, many people died. But that was the only way, I believe, in history. And God was in history to awaken America to the destiny that God had for them. And God is doing the same thing with the church. Because evil is down here. I'm not implying that the whole, there are no, everybody in the church is sleeping. I'm talking corporately as a church. If we understand the potential of what the church has, and I'll talk about this next Sunday, is this. I'm going to ask the question, are we moving into that potential today? And we are not. Are we exerting influence in the global economy, in the world today? Are we able to bring God's dimension to solve, even right now, climate warming? I want to tell you, this is not a problem you can solve on fiscal means. We need a restoration in the spiritual dimensions. You understand now, if you're a believer, you walk under open heaven. I've talked about this. Under open heaven then enables you as a believer, in faith, now with a new DNA as a child of God, to reach up into heavenly dimensions, to bring heavenly promises to earthly realities. I want to tell you this. You know that anointing is so strong. Genesis chapter I know, Matthew chapter 16, 18. Jesus said, and I gave them the keys of the kingdom. And the keys of the kingdom is so strong. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you bind in heaven is bound on earth. And you know, with that comes even the power to forgive sins. I'm not saying you're God. But I want you to understand the magnitude that you can call the things which be not as though they were. Even right now, in the recession, I want to tell you this. Each of us got to learn. I've learned to call the things. And in the recession, amen, we always have progression. Amen. amen. You hear the word I released last year. Last year was economic downturn. But yet we moved. 208 was economic downturn. God said, now start the church. 1998, no good. Because then God told me, now I want you to start full-time ministry. The year 2000, I prophesied about it. It's no good. The next year was going to be even down. And that happened, 2001. I didn't know it was going to happen. But it did. 2001, what happened? September 11, the economy collapsed. But that's the year God launched us into missions. And God began to take us to different countries. We went to 12 countries. Where did the money come from? I really don't know. How many know this? God's economy is not determined by the world's economy. Today, you see doom and gloom. But God says what? If you understand who you are in Christ, there's only future and there's hope. Amen. But in this, you've got to understand who you are in Christ. In this right now, <clears throat> we are in the era. God has got no plan C. That's why not only did He send Jesus, what was Jesus coming to do? Not only to in propitiation for your sin, paid the price. Not only to redeem you out of darkness, but make you to be a child of God, to make you to be a new creation, today to be a temple of the Holy Spirit, and He that's in you is greater than He that's in the world. Amen. Amen. And the Holy Spirit anointing, the Holy Spirit power, I want to hear this, this is not for some people. The prophet Joel said in that time, he's going to pour it upon all flesh. Not only on special people. Don't think it's only just for ministers of God. Don't think it's just with people, the fivefold ministry. I won't tell you this. It's all irrespective. Even the maid servant, man servant, all. 
I get excited because we are in the generation. If the church don't wake up, there is no plan C. God is going to work it, and it's either you are in it or you're out of it. And God's still going to do it. Sorry, God's not going to say, let's hold back because Sister Catherine not yet ready. God said, my Kairos is ready. I don't worry about who is not ready or not. Amen. No, he's not going to hold back. If you are wise with signs of time, you know there is an acceleration of what God is doing even right now. Do not get caught up with the wrong things. Align. I keep, you keep hearing me say that. We got to learn to align. Get back into relationship. Faith comes from hearing. You cannot hear without a relationship with God. And God has a plan for the church. That's my response to hear where we're going as a church. But God has a play, place for your personal life and your responsibility is to learn to hear. Amen. Amen. If God tells you to come to church, come. Yeah. If God tells you you better leave this church, then leave. I'm not chasing anybody away, please. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Yeah. Because God may ask somebody if they're not ready to be part of what God has as an initiative for this very church. Amen. Amen. In our church, we have an initiative God gave us what we want to make word-based, spirit-led, faith-filled disciples. Because why? God showed us this is going to be the final wave of God. It's going to be word-based. It's going to be spirit-led. It's going to be faith-filled. Amen? Amen? And we need to understand this. My time is up. I haven't even gone through half what I was going to preach. <laughs> but I want you to say, hear this. Just catch the anointing of this. Jesus paid the price that I can be like Adam before the fall. Adam was blessed. He operated in a perfect environment before the fall. We are operating in a fallen environment. We are operating right now with a devil that's even working harder and faster. But God gave us something that Adam never had. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. The authority of God today is with Man. But authority does nothing until what? The power of God is released. But the power of God is not released until man learns to take authority. Authority must be exercised. And listen to this. You can't exercise authority except you are under the very authority of God Himself. You can't do it your way. Amen. You've got to do it His way. Amen. And I will tell you, no plan C. You are it right now. This is the generation. Okay? And understand what was the garden about. Now, after restoration, you've got to experience the garden. It's about understanding gainful and purposeful work. It's understand that God must initiate. You've got to understand that God expects what? For you to position whatever position for you to be fruit, faithful. Right? And that faithfulness you can't do anything without the relationship with God, faith to begin to hear. Then He show you how to do it His way. And understand God expects fruitfulness. Amen? And not only that, in fruitfulness, God also expects you to learn to take ownership. And very important, last one, key. All hinges on one thing. Obedience. Obedience. Saul was anointed to be king. But he got tired of waiting for Samuel. What did he do? He be, made himself priest. And what did Samuel say to him? Obedience is better than sacrifice. Where is God positioning you right now? What does God want you to do? This is important. I close with this right now. And I believe this. God is going to move in such a mighty move of the Spirit starting this year, a new generation. You can be part of it or you can get left out. Amen. Don't waste time anymore. Time is short. God is calling. Let's quieten our hearts.